What's up? Welcome in back for part two of our end of season personnel meetings on the Chicago Bears with our friend Josh Lucas, Bears former director of player personnel. We had fun with this earlier in the week, went through the entire offense. Today, we're nailing down the defense. Uh, appreciate all the very kind responses. Uh, Josh, they love the episode on Tuesday. So uh, I think they'll enjoy this one today as well. In case you missed it, go back and find it. It's in there in the feed. Uh, Kevin and Kevin Fishbane also joined John Z yesterday for a senior bowl episode, uh, Fishbane down in mobile, uh, probably on his way back now. Uh, but check that out as well. But we're back together today. Uh, make sure you're following us on Twitter at Adam Hogue at Adam Johns and at Hogan Johns on Twitter, our show account as well. Hoganjohns.com. We're going to jump into this pretty quickly. Try to keep it rolling. Cause uh, Tuesday's episode was a longer one, but um, in just, to lay everything out again, guys, we'll we'll go through position group by position group. We'll start inside, work our way out. If you're watching on YouTube, this is a good episode to, to follow along on YouTube because our producer, Kent, has um, some visuals as we sort all this out into the categories that Josh has provided for us. Um, but if you're not watching on YouTube, that's okay because we're going to make it translate to uh, the, the podcast form as well. It should all make sense to you. Um, Josh, you want to just very quickly go through the categories here again, just to sort of set this up and how we're, we're putting these players, uh, and sorting them all out. Absolutely. You know, one top player, you know, it's a, it's a good to better than good on a good team. Basically you're talking about a pro bowl player, all pro player, uh, two's a good, a solid starter that, that we can win with now a guy that's going to start on all 32 teams. Three, your average, you know, starter probably, you know, would be a backup on a bunch of teams, uh, has some kind of contributing role. And also three can be a guy that, you know, maybe he's just a, a four core special teams player, you know, so not a guy you, you see a lot on, on offense and defense, but is on the roster because he's an outstanding special teams player uh, Four circumstance. This is your younger, unsure, you know, feel somewhat positive about them. There's upside there, and, and we still want to work with them. And five, below average, backup, not established, you know, a fill-in player for the 90-man roster. Um, as you noticed on the episode on Tuesday, you know, we didn't talk about a lot of fives because – those are the guys that are getting signed right now as futures guys that were on the practice squad this past year. So there are a lot of guys in the five category. We're just not going to talk about them because they, they weren't on tape this year and, and they're guys that are just weren't a part of the, you know, the actual Sunday football being played. Um, and six to, is time to move on from, and, and this one can be a little bit um, confusing to some people. You know, th this doesn't mean that the guy can't play anymore. It just means maybe he's a free agent. Maybe it's a maybe it's a salary issue. Uh, maybe it's declining talent, age concerns, injury concerns, um, and it's just best for the Bears to move on. Uh, whether that means just simply let the player um, his contract expire and him be, and him hit the free agency market, um, or if it's actually cutting the player and and moving on. So. I, those are the six categories. You know, there's a, there's a, uh, obviously a ton of ways you can skin the cat here. I just try to keep it really simple so we could do a podcast that, you know, I think the audience could follow and, and understand pretty easily. But, but just to remind everyone, these are what we're doing in these two podcasts here is very similar to what teams do when they get in their meeting rooms at the end of the season and they sort these players out the same way. So that's why we're doing this. Uh, we hope you enjoy the insight that, Josh brings to the table here. We're going to offer our opinions on these players, too. Again, we're going to work inside out. So we'll start with the defensive tackles. And I think a very interesting player that uh, that a decision needs to be made on. We'll start with Justin Jones. Wow. One, honestly, one of the, you know, he's a free agent. He's a good enough player to help your team win. You know, I think he's right on that fringe of two and three. You know, he's he's a. He's a he's an average starter in my opinion. He's not a consistent enough pass rusher, more of a flash pass rusher. 
run game is the exact same. You know, he'll he'll make some tackles for losses. He'll make some splash plays, but then you'll see him get washed out. To me, he's in that three category. He could be – I wouldn't be surprised at Hallis Hall if they're saying, hey, we're going to put him in the move-on category because he is a free agent and they need to get better. So that's going to come down to what does the money look like? Do they have bigger prize targets? My guess is they don't re-sign him and they, they, they sign someone that has a higher value um, and can bring more pass rush to the table. Um, but for now, I put him in that average category because that's what he is to me as a player. I'll do my best to be the numbers guy in this episode. Um, I went back and compared because I, I think we forget that he was plan B. Like Justin Jones was the Bears plan B. Larry Ogunjobi was their plan A to be that three technique, at least immediately in Maddie Bruce's defense. If you look at the numbers, Ogunjobi goes to Pittsburgh, probably a better defense overall for two years in a row. Maybe not this year because I think the Bears defense really came on. Justin Jones was part of that. But Justin Jones was the more productive player of the two. It's kind of funny to, to think about. Obviously, there's an injury. There was an injury concern there for Olga Joby. That's why the Bears moved on. But if I'm arguing Justin Jones's case, I like that he had a career best 17 QB hits this year. That more than like doubles his production from previous years. Like his previous career high was seven. In 2022, obviously became a part of a better defense. Set career highs with uh, four and a half sacks. So he could still be a young emerging player. But like I, I'm with you too, Josh. Like he's probably in that two to three range. Trying to figure out where he fits. Probably high on that average range. I'm okay with him being in there because I think the Bears will try to get better. Maybe their fallback option, or if I'm in that room, maybe our fallback option is Resigning him to another short-term deal if I can't find someone better, but he's a good player, but you try to get better. I'm okay with him being in that average category, although I see a lot of good traits as well. Yeah, I'll keep my analysis short because I agree that this is where he should be. I think he's sort of the definition of this category, which, again, we'll try to remind you throughout the show what each one is um, so you can keep track of it. But, again, we're talking about average starter, backup, with a contributing role currently with upside. I mean, that's that's kind of what Justin Jones gives you. I mean, I don't know that he's going to get, you know, improve from what he has been, but he does give you, you know, flash plays in the backfield. Um, I think he's been valuable in that locker room. I think he likes being here too for, for whatever that's worth. Josh, is this a player that you think you can afford to be patient with because maybe if you let him hit the open market, he doesn't necessarily sign right away that maybe a week or two in the free agency, you could still have a chance if once again, plan a doesn't work out for you. Yeah. He's he, I don't think he goes right away. Um, because of the nature of the position and there's such a lack of supply and the demand is so high. He's not a guy that you can – we used to call it Tidewater. We'd put these guys in Tidewater saying, hey, let them hit free agency. They're going to sit there for a while. You know, if we don't get what we want, we can always try to get them back on a team-friendly deal. I don't think you're going to have the luxury to put Justin in Tidewater because of some of the numbers that Adam hit on and the fact that he's an inside guy that can hit the quarterback. So um, they're going to have a plan A, and I think – exactly what you said he's he's going to be a plan b for them but you're not going to be able to wait too long it's it's going to be in the first for first two three weeks for sure um somebody will tie this guy up and and get him in their roster all right well let's move on to the guy that i think they hope becomes the uh the three technique they really need but he's also a very interesting player coming out of his rookie season jervon dexter uh, most interesting player on this entire roster in my opinion, he's for me, a, he's the three arrow up, you know, you, you can't put him in that two quick category yet. You, you could put him in the circumstance if you wanted to um, as well. I think he played enough to show that he's a three with an arrow up. His good is outstanding. His bad is awful. I'm a little concerned from a guy that's coming from the university of Florida how inconsistent the technique is, how bad the pad level is. 
you know, if they draft, if this was the guy from Kennesaw State, if this was the guy from Mount Union or some small school, um, I think I could understand some of the technique um, pad level issues that he has throughout the course of a game. If he could become consistent, this guy could go all the way to the top of this category because this guy has rare traits. I haven't seen too many guys that can pop straight up out of their stance and still just rock a guard back into the quarterback because he's so big and powerful. He can run. I think his instincts are average at best, and they're probably going to limit his ceiling a little bit. Um, this is, I told you yesterday or Tuesday, two biggest off seasons are Darnell Wright and even, even more so this guy because they need him to be a consistent game wrecker in the middle of the in the middle of the defense he has the talent i have major concerns about his just instincts and natural feel to play the game so he's a three right now with an arrow up yeah i, I agree with you i don't think you could put him in the category any, any higher than that because he really didn't play that much for all the things we just said about justin jones there's a reason he put up those numbers it's because he was playing more and there was a point actually early in the season where i felt very concerned about what the future held for Jervon Dexter. Now he's a young player. There's a lot to learn. It is a big adjustment sometimes when you're switching schemes like this, but he did come on later in the year. His numbers improved. The production was there. He showed that he could be part of your rotation. Well, at the very least he did. So put him in three average with that big arrow up. I think that them hiring Eric Washington too, as the new DC, um, I think the hope there is that he can have a huge impact on Dexter specifically uh, with Washington's experience in this scheme um, and him being a defensive line coach uh, throughout his career. The impact there could be big. Now, let me ask you this, Josh. For this position in this scheme specifically, if you're talking about a Super Bowl caliber roster, do you do you have to have a three technique that's in that top player category or can you survive with just good? You know, obviously that all comes down to your head coach and your quarterback and, and the rest of your roster. Like, so I, I don't want to, I don't want to dance around the question. To me, it's as important as any position on the defense and for the Bears specifically right now, it's where they need the most help. So this is a huge, huge uh, offseason for him. Um, you you don't want to just be good at three technique, especially in this system. You know, he, his body type fits more of what we used to do with Vic, more of that five technique. Um, he has the ability to get – to become a consistent – disruptor he's a long ways away you're looking at the two super bowl teams right now kansas city's got the best one in the league uh san francisco's got two three technique five technique type guys they hard graze more of your three technique armstead's fallen off a bit but they're really good there you got you got to be really good at this position um and that's what you're getting at um on a positive note my early in my career Jacksonville drafted Marcus Stroud out of Georgia, top 10 pick first round, all traits, all traits. Rookie year tape was gross. Like this is a miss. Second year, really good. By his third year, he was dominant. So it takes time for some of these guys to just get to the speed, learn the technique, realize you just can't play straight up and with your God-given ability. Um, so I've seen upward uh, transitions like this with, with players with this kind of talent, and I hope he can hit it because if they hit on this guy and he starts wrecking games from the middle of the field, you know, not, now you got, you're really cooking with him and Sweat and, and some of these other guys they have obviously on the back end of this defense. And that's exactly why – I think we all think this is one of the most important off seasons uh, in terms of a specific player on the entire roster um, because it also puts the bears in a tough spot because they got to either bet that it's going to happen or 
you know, hedge that bet with uh, another draft pick or, you know, spending some money on the position. Um, all right, let's go to the other rookie going into year two, and that's Zach Pickens. Yeah, Zach is an easy guy for me. Um, he he falls in that three category. He's an, he's a very easy guy to evaluate. Um, I think his ceiling is pretty low, but his floor is high. I don't think they're going to miss on this player because he's already a pretty good two down run stopper. My fear and concern with this player is he's never going to be a three down player. I don't think he's got the feet and the hips to be a consistent winner one-on-one -on -one in the pass rush. His pass rush production is going to come on effort. It's going to come on, you know, missed assignments up front. I don't see this guy winning one on one on one rushes consistently enough ever to be a true three down player. Um, I think what he is right now is probably similar to what he's going to look like in a few years. You're not going to miss on him, which is good. And he's got the ability to be a really good two down run player. Yeah, I'm with you. Average. I, I like that. He well, yeah, I thought he had a good training camp, perhaps better than Dexter. I like that he was able to contribute in some shape or form. I, I like that he was able to play with Dexter a lot, having two young rookies on the, on the field at the same time, learning together, growing together, failing together in a sense. So that's a positive for me. But, yes, it's just hard to put him in any other category than number three right now. Yeah, I might make a small argument for circumstance um, because, I, you know, just personally, I feel a little bit unsure. Maybe just because of what Josh said, too. I feel like the ceiling is is limited. Um, and I'm not sure he's ever going to be a consistent starter um, that you can rely on. But, um, you know, I think he does have value. So I'm perfectly fine with him being in the three category as well. Um, let's move on to the last defensive tackle, and that's Andrew Billings. <laughs> Andrew Billings. So for what he is, you know, I put him in the good category just because he is really good at his role. There's going to be a lot of people inside of personnel rooms that are going to argue that he belongs in the average category solely because he's not a three down player. He doesn't have that in his tool belt. You know, he's a, he's a he, no sack guy this year. I think he's got four sacks in six years in the league. That's not his role. That's not what they ask him to do. Um, it's a limiting factor that limits his ceiling. But when he is asked to stop the run, he was better this year than he's been in the past. And he's been a good run stopper in the past. So for in his role, for me, I put him in the good category. I would totally understand moving him to average because of his lack of pass rush. But this is a disruptive dude against the run. You feel him on tape. You feel him getting penetration. And even in his pass rush once in a while, you feel him get pushed and get some knock back into the quarterback. Um, I, I, I thought it was good that they extended him in season. You got two nose tackles on your roster now that are going to be there for a while. Um, and I put him in the good category just because he's really good at the role they asked him to do. There are some stretches this season where I thought Andrew Billings might be the, the best player, at least in terms of performance, like actual on field play. Like I thought he was the best player on defense. He looked that good. Like he, he was but in the back. Before they field. added sweat, I think you have a strong argument yeah. that it might have been the case, at least on the D line. Right. Right. Yeah. Especially up front. Right. I, I get that TJ Edwards came on and Kyler Gordon had a good year and Jalen Johnson had an outstanding year, but there were periods of time like up front, Andrew Billings was the Bears' best player. And I think the Bears are, are with you, Josh. So I'm. Well, I'm with you on this. The, the Bears already gave him a deal. He's a good player. He's a good starter. Put him in that second tier category. Um, I think the contract extension that they gave him in the middle of the season says everything. They already see him as that good player, that good starter that you could count on. This is this is where, as a personnel department, you know, it's so important to be well rounded throughout your entire department and have good scouts all the way down, because. Ian Cunningham and 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 Ryan Poles, they're not watching 
Andrew Billings on free agent tape. You know, like they're not spending their time watching two down nose tackles. So this is your, you know, your Chris White, your JJ Kosh, you know, all your young scouts that are in there digging these guys up. They bring them to the GM and say, hey, like this guy's undervalued and this guy can help us. And 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 I and I'm willing to bet that's kind of how this facilitated. Uh, and now you got a guy in your roster you extended and you're happy with. And, and that's why, you know, personnel department can make a huge difference in, in pro free agency with these cheap, cheap under the radar signings. Yeah, good value, too, now locked up for the next two years. I like him in that good category as well. I'm an Andrew Billings fan. I like the signing at the time. Um, I and I I agree, even though he's not gonna bring the sacks, I think he like he's a sneaky pass rusher sometimes. Like he'll he'll get some pressure in, in the pocket and make things a, at least a little muddy. So um I'm a big fan of Andrew Billings. I like him in that two category. All right, let's uh move outside to the defensive ends now, and we'll start with the obvious one that we probably don't spend too much time on, but that's Montez Sweat. Most uh, top player. Not only did they uh, uh, execute the trade to get him in the building, but did an outstanding job to get that deal done quickly to give them leverage on the Jalen Johnson deal. So that whole process and transition from the front office was outstanding. And then you get a guy that comes in and not only plays well, but plays better than he played at his previous stop, well-rounded, in all facets, the most important thing a player can do on Sunday is produce. The second most important thing he can do is multiply and make guys around him better. Check all the boxes. They hit a home run with this to, so far. Uh, let's hope he keeps his momentum and and, and has a huge 2024 um, because he was good and he made everyone else better. Yeah, I thought the Bears acquired a, a good player but they ended up with a, a great player. And this goes to the locker room as well, just how he was embraced and how he embraced his own role of no longer being one of four, but being the, the guy and how his teammates started to gravitate towards that, especially his younger teammates. If you see them interact in the corner of, of that locker room at Hallis Hall, great move by the bears. Obviously Montez Sweat is a top player. I thought it was interesting too. Ron Rivera was on uh, Waddle and Sylvie this week. And he said that, he thinks that Montez Sweat's just scratching the surface still. Like there's all like there's still room for growth there for him as a player. Um, and if that's the case, that's that that, that could it, it, this already seems like a home run trade, but it, then it can make that contract that they signed him to uh well worth it too. Um so it'll be interesting to see if Montez Sweat can continue to to build uh next season as well. All right. Let's go, um, I guess, with the guy that they signed before Sweat that they were hoping to get more out of, and then he ended up getting hurt before the end of the year, and that's Yannick Ngakwe. Yeah, Yannick, you know, I think he got signed in August here, and I remember turning on the, the local media, and there was a lot of buzz, um, you know, because of his career production as a pass rusher, and I went back and watched the tape, and in Indy and he's a, he's a savvy rusher that knows how to get sacks, but he is not a one-on-one -on -one pass rusher. He does not win consistently versus tackles in this league anymore. The arrows down, you know, this is another guy where you could, you can put him in all kinds of different categories to me. They need to get younger. They need to get better. He's a free agent. I would put him in the move on category um, and then let him sit out there and he'd be the classic Tidewater guy that I explained earlier. There's a reason this guy sits out, you know, until uh, uh, July and in August, and he's still available. He's just a niche pass rusher. He's a below average run stopper. Um, I didn't think he was very impactful for the Bears. There were some stretches where he was just just below average, um, more of just of a flash guy that can sneak into some snack sacks. I would move on, try to find younger and better. You get to camp and you're in that same hole you're in last year and you want to sign them to a one-year deal again. You like them in the locker room. I get it. But for me right now, building a vision and a plan for 2024, it would be move on. Yeah. You know, he got a one-year deal, $10.5 million. The Bears got four sacks out of it. And now you have an injury, a broken ankle 
to consider moving forward. Easy decision for me. He's in the move on category. Look to get younger. Look at those pass rushers with the ninth pick. You have some good options there. Time to move on. I also thought it was telling that after they added Sweat, you know, he didn't you you would have thought that that would have helped him a little bit, get some better matchups, maybe pop pop a little bit more, and then that didn't happen before he got hurt. So um, yeah, I'm totally fine with him in the move on category. I think that's ultimately what will happen. The, the only path I can see to him being back on the Bears next year is Josh, like what you were just talking about. He's still out there in August. Someone got hurt. You're desperate. Um, and you know he knows the defense and can come back in, but that's pretty much the only path I see him being on the roster. Yeah, I, I watched he's got I think he's got 13 and a half sacks his last two years combined, and I could be off by a sack or two. I watched the sack reel. I think two or three of those 13 sacks were real. I beat the tackle to the quarterback sack. The other ones were extended plays, looping around, free rushes. Like he does have some savvy and some instincts, but his ability to just come off the edge and whoop a tackle's ass, that's six, seven years in the past, you know, and it's it's not coming back. All right, how about Demarcus Walker? Demarcus Walker, uh, he's a classic three all day for me. Um, you know, you love the ruggedness in the run game. When I watch tape on him, um, the ruggedness in the run game uh, is what stands out. He's a tough ass. He plays hard. Um, they Their lack of rush early in the year, you know, they'll, they'll move them inside to get their – rushman package or you know to get their their best rushers on the field i don't see there's some value there you'll see him win with some quickness on the, on the inside doesn't have enough power to play inside consistently not a real good one-on-one -on -one pass rusher on the outside more of just a flash rusher he's a really good backup you know they started him early in the year out of necessity um i think going into next year he's on the roster he's under contract if he's one of your – he's your three, four, five, anywhere in that that rotation mix, you're happy. If he's your starter, you need better. Yeah, I think you have a player who's approaching 30. If you need him to start, he can. He can be productive. He can play inside and out. That's a positive. But it's hard to argue against making some significant investment up front. I think the Bears already started to go down that path. I thought you saw it with Dexter and Pickens being drafted. I think some pass rushers are next. You might even get some of that in free agency. But then DeMarcus Walker, again, could be part of that backup rotation, part of your rotation. So I think he fits perfectly in that average three category. Yeah, I agree. You put him in that three without the arrow up. He kind of is what he is, but he does bring you value, you know, certainly as a rotational guy who can kick inside, help you in a, in a couple different ways. Um, so I think he makes a lot of sense there. Uh, in that three category. All right. How about Rasheem green? Kind of in the same mold. You know, I, I put him in the, uh, the, the three category as well. Um, not good enough as a pass rusher. Looks the part looks like he was created to play defensive end in the NFL. He's beautiful. He's long, but he's never been a consistent producer. Um, he's a stout, big, strong run player. You know, a lot of these guys we're talking about that were added this offseason, Green and um, obviously Walker and Billings, a lot of reason they went from bottom of the NFL, stopping the run to top of the NFL because they brought in a lot of big bodies that are hard to move, um, sound, play their gap soundly. That's what he is. He's, he's never going to be any better than he is. He's never going to probably be any worse than he is right now. Another guy I'm pretty sure is, um, you know, still under contract. And, you know, if he's your fifth, fourth defensive end, I think you're okay with that. No different than Walker. If he's starting, it, you got to have better. Yeah, I, I think sometimes the actions speak louder than the words. Green was your starter literally for the almost the entire duration of training camp. Then they sign a guy for ten and a half million dollars, and then during the year they, you know, trade a second round pick for Montez Sweat and give him a blockbuster deal. So those are important actions to me. Green, um, he's a backup rotational player, good against the run, nothing more than that. I think he's safely in three here. 
Yeah, I agree. He, he's in three. Um, and a little special teams value because he did block two kicks this year. So he's that, ma- that matters. And, and he is a UFA. So that's another guy where I wouldn't be surprised. You know, um, sometimes you're in that mood in February, uh, January, whenever you have this meeting, sometimes you're in that mood where you just want to reset it. You're like, you know, we need to be better up front. Uh, rushing the passer, we're going to reset it. So if, if they're sitting in that meeting and they put him in the move on category because he's a free agent, that wouldn't shock me either. Um, another guy that will just kind of hang around for a while. He's not a guy that's going to get signed really quickly. So three or move on is is where he belongs. All right. Uh, last D lineman, and that is Dominique Robinson. Dominique Robinson, um, to me, is you know one of these guys where you 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 take a guy that has traits that's way far away from being ready to play, um, and you know in in two years he has not shown that he's going to be an NFL football player. Um, I would put him, you know, he's still on a cheap deal. Um, it's not time you don't need to move on from him um so he would go into that circumstance category for me you know where there's young there's still some upside you know i'm pretty sure there's probably some people in the building that you know because of the you know the ego and the the connectedness to it's our draft pick and you know we see it they're probably a little more bullish on them but the reality is this guy gets a lot of snaps and he does not make any plays and he has no plan as a pass rusher. So you take all those traits and they all just kind of go to mush because he doesn't know how to play the game of football. You know, he's just, he was a quarterback receiver outside back. There's a reason he keeps moving positions. He's just not a very good football player. Yeah. I'm here to argue that he's in the below average category after two years. Now, again, with the actions speak louder than words argument, he was inactive a lot by the end of the year. And the, I think the bears saw what you're seeing. You saw all year, Josh, you're just not getting anything from him when he's on the field. Your expectations were probably a bit higher because he's a draft pick. I can understand some argument in the building for keeping him because you need depth. He's a young player. He is a draft pick. I understand all that, but after two seasons and, you know, and even some good moments in training camp, you just have never seen it in real games. So I'm going to say below average for me. Yeah. I'm going to probably go below average too. As soon as they got sweat, he went to inactive on game day. The only reason he came back active late in the year is because Ngakwe got hurt, Uh, but he never really did much. You know, he basically lost his playing time um, until out of necessity. So as we kind of transition this conversation to the needs uh, on the D line, I think we're all going to assume here. They're going to try to add, a legitimate number two defensive end. And that's probably just going to slide Dominique Robinson down more. And I just find it hard to believe that he's going to make this team, honestly, out of training camp. Below average. Thank you. That's really, that's really where I wanted to go. I just, <laughs> we didn't draft him. So I was just being nice. I <laughs> gotcha. All right. So how do, how do you want to summarize the needs on the D line? before we move on to a different position. They're set at nose tackle, um, which makes you feel good. Um, they have to add another three technique. So this is interesting. Do you go Do you go big? You know, are you watching this Chris Jones saga? What's going to happen with him and, and KC? Justin Matabuke in Baltimore is my favorite free agent in this entire free agent class. Would be an ass kicker in Chicago. Uh, I highly doubt he gets out of Baltimore. He's that good. They'll probably franchise him or get a deal done. Um, do you do do you splash there? And then you have a dude and a young dude with upside. I think that would be super exciting. That's what I would try to do if it's available, uh, whether that's in the draft. But they got to add a three technique, and they have to add an, a starting defensive end. That, that that would be my two major needs. They have plenty of backup DNs. Um, obviously, they have one stalwart special DN. They need a starter opposite of Sweat, and they have to add a three technique. Yeah, in terms of roster building, I always love the idea of 
pairing like that established standout veteran like Sweat, who already has his big money with that promising rookie. Like I'm looking at those guys with the number nine pick and being like, can one of those guys be a significant contributor uh, on day one? Rotate with Demarcus Walker if you have to for a little bit, but I like the idea of drafting one early, especially a, a pass rusher over a three techniques. I just think. It, I don't know. I just think maybe that's the value of the position, um, but I'm with you. Both of those are major needs going forward. All right. Let's let's uh, let's back up then and go behind the D-line and talk about some of these linebackers. We'll start with the, uh, the starters and uh, Tremaine Edmonds. Tremaine Edmonds. Overall, when you're talking about return on the dollar, to me, he's a little bit of a disappointment. At the end of the day, he's a good player. You know, there's probably some people that might slide him into that average category. I think I'm a, I left him in the good category. I think the stats are misleading. I think his stats are, you know, a little eye popping when you see the four interceptions, when you see the, uh, you know, triple digit tackles. The tape doesn't match the stats. This guy doesn't create plays. Plays come to him a lot. He got very fortunate on a lot of these interceptions this year. He doesn't attack the game. He lets the game come to him. He's a reactor. He's not an anticipator. He's blessed with God-given traits that allow him to get away with it. Um, he's a solid player. He's not a top player. Um, there's there's some issues with zone coverage that, you know, would would – maybe cause some people to move them down into this average category. A um, little disappointing, like I said, bang for the buck, but taking away the contract and just what he is as a player, I left him in the good category because he can play on all three downs. I want to see more pass rush out of this player because there's pass rush production in the past. We didn't see it this year. I think I know why that is. Um, and that has to do with the guy playing next to him. Um, but uh to me, I'll leave him in the good category. Yeah, I think he's squarely in the good category. Uh, if we're going through positives, I'd like that he won. Like, if you're the Bears, he got the Ball Hawk Award, which I think is meaningful for Matt Eberflus and the coaching staff. That's just in terms of ball production, takeaways, and whatnot. Um, at the same time, like, I, I, re I remember making note of this throughout the season where there's some completions over the middle. Um, some long completions, and I'm like, isn't this like right over Tremaine Edmonds? And this is like, isn't this where you need him to be or use all those physical gifts that he has to to break up those passes? You know, tip it at the very least, get his hands on the ball. Um, I like to see that happen. He had some injuries happen this year, so I think you have to take that into account. Um, the contract to me is part of the conversation because the Bears did give him so much money. Um, and I think that kind of prevents him from any top player argument, but um, squarely in tier two, good player, good starter for me. Yeah, I still think he's a solid starter, which is the you know what we're defining this category as. Um, but I think the issue becomes, well, they kind of paid him as more of a top player, sort of yeah. like on that line. And so are you getting the value like you're obviously getting with the next guy we're going to talk about um, the ball Hawk award. I think that does matter internally, but just to be completely clear about that, it is a points based system. So it doesn't necessarily allow for, for nuance like Josh was just talking about, you know, th did the ball come to him or did he go make the play either way? He, you know, the points are the points and it ends up at the end of the season with him getting the award that they hand out there uh, in the organization. But yeah, I think he's, he, he belongs in this two category. Um, the question is, is he giving you as much value as TJ Edwards, who's our next player? Yeah, TJ, this is this is shocking for me that I'm I'm putting TJ in the in the in the two category. After week one, I would have put him in the move on category. Um, <laughs> I'm always concerned about space players that don't run well. But if you talk about a guy that that knows how to cover up his limitations through angles, instincts, and anticipation, this is the player. I got to give him his props. He had a hell of a year. Um, he's an outstanding run stopper in the box. He's strong tackler. His limitations come in space. 
Um, I thought smart teams attacked them, and I thought Flus did a good job of uh, limiting some exposures of him in coverage as the year went on. Um, a, a lot of the reason why you didn't see Tremaine Edwin's uh, pass rush production is because they had to leave him in coverage at all times because they rushed Edwards a lot um, to hide his space limitations. His picks are real. He makes plays. He can bait quarterbacks with his eyes, get quarterbacks to throw the ball, um, you know, and 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 he, I thought his three interceptions, uh, not all of them, I thought two of the three, they were real plays. And uh, he, he, I'm not in the building. He looks like he's the heart and soul of that defense. Um, bang for your buck as far as return on value, outstanding. Um, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm, I'm putting him in the two category because that's what he was this year. He was a good, solid winning football player that, that could have played on any team and, and, and been a good, solid winning player. I'm here to bang the ta- table for him to be in the top player. Whoa. Category. Yeah. 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 Um, I think he outplayed his contract. I like Josh said, yes, I, I think everything in that locker room about him being the heart and soul of the defense is real. I think the Philadelphia Eagles, one of the best defenses in the league last year. Um, I think they took a step back this year because guys like him were missed. They didn't value the linebacker position. The bears did worked out in the bears favor. Um, he outplayed his contract. So some numbers for you, like just in terms of because he took over that Roquan Smith role, well, the one that the Bears couldn't, you know, obviously Roquan Smith, all pro, outstanding player. But just in terms of like production, Roquan Smith, 158 tackles. TJ Edwards, 155. Roquan Smith, one and a half sacks. TJ Edwards, two and a half sacks. Roquan Smith, one interception. T.J. Edwards, four interceptions. QB hits, Roquan Smith, five. T.J. Edwards, eight. Tackles for loss, Roquan Smith, five. T.J. Edwards, eight. So he outplayed the All-Pro he replaced in a sense. So if I'm in that room, that's that's what I'm saying. I'm like, guys, we, I know he's got his limitations and whatnot. I, I get that he relies on his instincts, but boys. We hit a home run with this one. This was a great acquisition. He fit our defense perfectly. This is a top player for me based on what he did in 2023. All right, so Josh, this is an interesting conversation. Uh, I I would like to hear, and maybe I'm wrong. I feel like you're going to have a little bit of a rebuttal to what John's just said. Uh, Perhaps as just from the scout's eye, talking about those numbers that that John's just brought up and maybe the guy who also had a, had a part in drafting Roquan Smith, but is there something missing when you're just comparing those numbers and a pretty convincing argument there that John's made that TJ Edwards in some ways outplayed Roquan Smith? Super simple, super simple. We play the saints 2020, 21. We're not worried about Alvin Kamara because Roquan's going to match him all game. TJ Edwards, you have to hide. Like you saw it against Green Bay. Like they went the Green Bay when Aaron Jones is out there and he's fast, you have to hide that matchup. And that's a huge, huge difference between the two players. The stats, the production, outstanding. Uh, that's why I put him in the good category. But this is a player that you have to scheme around because he has major limitations. Roquan has no limitations. You can go, you know, if if Aaron Jones goes and flexes out, you're not worried about it. You're going to go match him up. They have Queen as well, obviously, um, where TJ Edwards, now you got to worry about maybe playing somebody bracketing over the top. Um, there's a reason he was blitzing so much. Um, when they started playing all that man coverage to change the defense, it was because he's got limitations in coverage and man. So, that's the biggest difference. That's why he's a $20 million player versus a, a $80 million player. Cause teams don't see him as a coverage guy and it's a coverage league. Um, so that would be the, the, the separator between the two. Well, I feel like I'm in uh, a tough spot here, you know, with that can, Wisconsin- can, I give, can I give my rebuttal real quick? Okay. Yeah. According to pro football reference, I know these stats can be misleading, but the average passer rating thrown at Throwing at TJ Edwards this year was 90.8. 
um, high completion percentage. But Roquan Smith, average pass rating thrown at him, 103.5, another high completion percentage of 77.0%. So I, I'm with you. Um, I think the contract to me comes into play. Like you just matched. I get it. I think Roquan might be the better player, but just in terms of like getting production, bang for your buck. I love what TJ Edwards gave the Chicago Bears this year. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's a very interesting discussion between, especially considering like this is the reality of what the the, the decision this front office made was. To... Do you think Joshua, like in that room now? Do you think there are like given your experiences, like is this one they're like celebrating? Oh yeah, they're they're yeah. they're extremely happy with, and and there could be even more to it then then you guys probably have a better feel than i do because i'm not in that locker room but um the other thing with roquan is you're bringing row into your locker room there's a reason when row walked into baltimore they went from middle of the pack to very top of the pack like there's certain guys that are just absolute multipliers to your defense so if tj brings that and i'm sure ian cunningham had a a a, a a good knowledge of what TJ was going to bring to the locker room, then you're even celebrating it even more um, because he's a good player that galvanizes and, and, and helps lead your team. So uh, without a question, uh, this is a, a free agent uh, a grand slam because of the number they paid him um, and the production he put up uh, and even when they change philosophy and change the way they were playing defense, you know, mid to late of the season, he still found ways to produce and they still found ways to make him effective. Um, so to your point, yes, they're, they're high five and they're very, they're, this is, this is a good one. All right. Well, that's a fascinating discussion. I, unfortunately I do have to break this tie and uh, I feel like there's pressure on me because I have that Wisconsin Badger helmet behind me. Um <laughs> I'm going to put him in the good category, though. I like oh. TJ Edwards a lot. But, you know, if top to me, Roquan Smith is top player. TJ Edwards is good. Um, but yes, with the contract, you're very, very happy with what TJ Edwards gave you. So um, I, I think the two spot is uh, is the right spot here. Um, now, the next guy I might talk up a little bit more than he actually, uh, I feel like, gets credit for. But Jack Sanborn, what do you think about him, Josh? He's interesting to me. I don't think he's much different than um, than TJ Edwards. I think he's on a very similar um, path right now. Um, right now, he would fit in that third category, kind of an average backup. Um, because he's the third linebacker, um, you know, in their base defense, you know, he doesn't play a lot. It doesn't play as much as, you know, 20 years ago, your third linebacker was on the field all the time. Now, now your third linebacker is your nickel. Um, and, and that's why, you know, his production and, and, and his play snaps are down for a starting linebacker. Um, I love his length, his toughness. I think he runs a little bit better than TJ Edwards. It's funny that they're both undrafted free agents out of uh, um, uh, Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Yeah. And, um, don't do that to Hogue. <laughs> Absolute outstanding for agent signing. Um, I think he fits squarely in that average category. And could he get to that good category? You know, I think the the six, seven, eight games he played consecutively as a true starter filling in for Rowe last year. That there's enough tape there to say that if this guy became a starter, if he could stay healthy and become an every down starter, he could get to that good category. You could probably put an arrow up on him. Um, but right now I think he fits right in that average category under contract. He's dirt cheap. He's on a, you know, he's a, he'll be going into his third year on that rookie minimum and he's a really good guy to have on the team and, and, and an excellent fill in if one of those top two guys go down. Yeah, I think he's the definition of what three is, right? Starter slash backup, contributing role with, with upside. You know, I think we've seen that over over two years. Um, he plays on special teams. Could it be better? Yeah, but the Bears, with their actions, you know, they signed T.J. Edwards, a former teammate, to, to basically start over him. 
despite his success as a rookie. So I think he fits perfectly. Like he's the definition of what three of the three categories should be. So I'm going to lose this tiebreaker, obviously, because there isn't a tiebreaker. But I just um, I want to go back to 2022 real quick on my grades. And yeah, when he played, when he was starting there uh, later on in the year after they traded Roquan Smith, to me, he played like a two. I thought he I thought he was a good player when he was an actual starter. And I, we talked about this last offseason. We were a little bit surprised when they made the moves that they did to bring in two linebackers and push Jack back down to the Sam. Now, they're in a great spot because they essentially have three, you know, solid starters, in my opinion, in two and a half spots where they actually need to play um, on the field. So that's a good spot to be in. Um, so me personally, I think I would bump him up into that good category. He kind of reminds me of Andrew Billings on the D line. Cause it's just like, you, you know, he's not gonna be on the field every down, but when he's out there, you know, you can rely on him, but, uh, no, can we can keep him in average because that's, um, the, the other, the, there's two votes to one. Two yeah. And, now, unless you, Adam Hogue is Brian Poles now. <laughs> what, what I really like about Sanborn is his, his ability to play. Um, in zone coverage in the pass game because he's got he's got feel he can drop depth he can feel things coming uh, you know developing behind him something that you know like Tremaine Edmonds does not do a very good job of and he's got really good length so he's hard to throw over and he gets his hands on a lot of balls uh, I agree with what you said John's like they're in a good spot you know that, that, that was a good move for them to sign two vets and then have him as the third. And, and then obviously they drafted the young kid out of Oregon to, to give him some more speed. So they're, they're, they're looking good at linebacker right now. Yeah. Just to speed this up, let's do a two for one here. Let's try to, let's see if we can knock out Noah Sewell and uh, Dylan Cole together just to knock out the linebackers. Yeah. I just threw Cole in the average because he's a four core teamer. You know, you'd probably put him in the below average if you were just talking about him as a linebacker. So that's where that gets into, like, where are you placing his value? Dylan Cole's on your team to play special teams. Um, so that's why I put him in the average category. And Noah Sewell, um, you know, love the speed, love the ability to play in the box and fill against the run. I saw some major instinct issues on preseason tape made me realize probably why he lasted as long as he did in the draft. Very slow reactor, not an anticipator. Um, I actually thought Baskerville was the more impressive linebacker during camp, um, but obviously doesn't have the height, weight, speed. But Sewell right now, uh, with just that preseason tape and special teams tape, would be in that circumstance spot for me. Yeah, pretty easy uh, for everything you said. Um, I'll, I'll talk about Sewell a little bit. Injuries. I mean, that, that you got to add that to the circumstance. I just feel like he was never, ever healthy. It was just one major thing after another. Um, he's got to stay in circumstance for me. Yeah, um, I agree with both of those as well. Uh, are there really any needs here with the linebackers? No, I mean, obviously, if they feel good about Sewell, you know, durability-wise and in, in his upward projection, you know, not your, your, your you know, you're always looking to add young athletic guys that can help on fourth down. They have Baskerville in the mix, you know, you know, guy we're not going to talk about, but he's got some ability and, and probably can play some special teams. You wish he was better on teams. Um, this would probably be um, free agent, cheap special team signing, um, late round height, weight, speed draft pick college free agent height weight speed that's probably what they're looking as far as pressing needs uh big money expenditures top draft picks i'd say no and just for the record um baskerville did end up in the below average category for josh probably a guy you could have in either circumstance or below average sure. I, I find him interesting too um and i think he you know, he'll certainly be around and make some plays here in the preseason. Maybe he takes a step forward. You don't know. So he, uh, he would have got if he could play special teams. Well, well, he would. He probably would have made the Bears roster um, if he was a better special teams player. Um, and he definitely would have got claimed because his his uh, linebacker tape in the preseason was really good. He did some stuff in the past game with awareness and instinct stuff that you don't see from some veterans. So that dude's interesting. 
but he's so small and he's not that fast. So he's not very good on special teams. So he's either a starter or he's a practice squad player. And, and that's where you get into trouble with guys that, that don't have traits and, and they're not good enough to be starters. All right, let's kick outside and talk about the cornerbacks. Um, a, a player who will command a lot of attention this offseason, Jalen Johnson. Top player. Uh, you can make the argument, you know, there's a point in the season of four to seven game stretch where he was the best corner in the NFL. Uh, the question was getting his hands on balls. He had four picks this year. Should have had six or seven. He dropped a handful. A um, couple of those could have completely changed games. <clears throat> you can match them. You can you can have them follow the other team's best receiver. The two knocks, three knocks on this guy going into this year. Ball production, check. Tackling, check. Now, we'll see if he tackles after he gets paid. I highly doubt it. And durability. And that's that's always going to be a concern with his shoulders because it was coming out. Um, but this is this is a top player, and and he is going to get paid top top corner money from that film he put on uh, put on tape this year. Pro Bowl player, second team All Pro. I think those accolades speak for themselves. I, I think the franchise tag is coming in his near future to help facilitate negotiations. I think it's needed. But you're right. You're looking at a cornerback who's about to, to reset the market. Bears defense is obviously better with him. I don't like that he has never played a full season. Yep. 13 games, 15 games, 11 games, 14 games. Like That's a problem for me. Um, you want a little bit more durability, but the numbers don't lie. He's one of the best players on this defense, one of the best cornerbacks in the league. All right, let's go to the other uh, outside corner spot in Tyreek Stevenson. Put him in the good category. This is an arrow up player. I can't I can't talk enough about what his physical attacking style at corner did for this defense. It's contagious. I think it rubbed off on on 33 on Jalen a little bit. Um, as good of a tackling corner as you'll see in the league. I think he's improving in man and in zone coverage. You know, I this guy could transition and play safety at some point in his career because he does see it. Ball production was good. Short memory, you know, playing opposite of the best top top five corner league, you're going to get targeted. He got targeted. You look up his PFF grade. It's not great. There's a lot of targets, receptions, and yards. You watch the tape. This dude gets after people. Yes, he got beat, but he comes right back and then he makes a play. This guy is good. I think he brings a, a edge to this defense. To me, he's good with an arrow up, and I would not be surprised at all if we do this next year at this time and he's in that top player category. This dude's a dog. You need dogs on your defense, and uh, he's one of them. Yeah, you saw that nasty mentality come out earlier, and, and I think – like I think he learned like early in training camp, especially when we went down to Indiana for the joint practices with the Colts. Like it was there, he was fighting everybody, and he loved that. Um, I thought that uh, it added a different bravado to the defense that wasn't there right away. And then you saw the Bears add to it the Montez Sweat as obviously with that big trade. But I like that he also learned how to knew when to bring out that mentality in a sense. Like at some point early in the year, you didn't like some of the penalties. But then I think he kind of matured as the season went on. You love the immediate ball production. Like I think that's different from Jalen Johnson, where that was a question with Tyreek Stevenson. He had four interceptions and two forced fumbles in his rookie year. Sure, playing on a good defense right away helps. Jalen Johnson didn't have that uh, benefit when he broke into the league. But Arrow is, is is big up for me. I mean, it is it is here. You love the demeanor. You love the energy. You love how he fits into that secondary and just the, the defense in general. He's a good player for me to begin with. I still go back to training camp and that little that that one day where we saw Chase Claypool like literally bullying him um, verbally uh, after a play that Tyreek Stevenson made on him and it just kept going and it kept going. It was going on for like 15 minutes even after Claypool got 
hurt in that practice. He's still chirping like the whole practice. It did not phase Tyreek Stevenson at all. Not one bit. And that told me right away, right there, like if this guy gives up a play, he's going to come right back. He's going to, he, he he's not going to let that phase him, which is so important at that corner position. And I think that turned out to be true during the season. I think he's got a lot of upside and I agree that he's, you know, already in this two spot in, in this two category is a good starter because he, he proved that throughout the season. Yeah. He's got, he's got that safety build. Um, kind of the safety movement a little bit. And I remember doing him as a sophomore at the University of Miami uh, my last year with the Bears because he, he was a third-year sophomore and had the ability to come out at that time. Um, and I would question, like, could he really be a man coverage guy in the NFL um, based on the way he moves and the way he's built? And he showed this year that there's no question that he, he can challenge guys and he can cover legit receivers in this league. All right, and then uh, we move inside to the slot position in Kyler Gordon. I love this player. I'm, you know, this kid to me, he's a, he's a good player. Arrow up. This guy's got a chance to be one of the better nickels in the league. He really does. When you have a nickel that can play in support the way this kid plays in support, it brings so much flexibility to your defensive coordinator and the way he can call and match up against personnel packages. This guy is tough. He knows how to knife in there. He can take on blocks. He can rush the passer and time his pass rush well. He's a really good man cover guy. He's still got to get better in zone. Um, can be a little jumpy and reactionary and, and – um, you know, can 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 shoot his gun a little bit too early at times. He's a good player. You know, you're going to give up a lot of targets and receptions when you're playing nickel in this league. It's the hardest position to cover. You're covering a receiver, and unlike Jalen and Tyreek, you don't have the sideline as your defense. You have a two-way go at all times. It's hard as hell to play man coverage in the slot, and he can do it. Look at Ar Armand St. – whatever his name is, St. Brown for the Lions, one of the best in the league. Look at his numbers when they play against the Bears because he can challenge them. And this dude has so much value. I'm a huge fan of this guy, like another one that could be a top player in a year from now. Um, I was really impressed with the way he played as a nickel in his second season. Yeah, when I was going through everything last night – I was tempted to make the argument for top player. I just don't think he's he's there yet. Maybe one more year, but I think Matt Eberflus found his version of Kenny Moore for the Bears defense. I think Kyler Gordon has fully embraced what that role means, too. This is a young, emerging, good player right now with a huge arrow up for me. Yeah, I'm right there with you guys. I think he is upper level of the good category. And and Buddy non potentially being a top player definitely arrow up has a chance to get there next year. Um, you know he's he's and he's really fun to watch. We 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 both agreed um, back in training camp that he was the defensive MVP of training camp. Unfortunately, he got banged up, missed a little time at the beginning of the season, um, and maybe that slowed him down a little bit. But um, he still came back and and realized what we saw in training camp. And now if he could put together a full season, um, I think he could have a, you know, an even bigger impact next year. So what, what happened, you know, 15, 20 years, the league spread out and all of a sudden 11 personnel became base offense. So now nickel becomes base defense and everyone wants these little tiny nickel corners who have that suddenness and quickness to cover these inside slots on the two way goes. So you had all these tiny little nickels. Remember Bryce Callahan when we were really good. And what happened with these smart offensive coordinators said, all right, you're going to play with those little nickels. We're just going to, we're just going to condense our formation and we're going to run right at them and attack those guys. So now you're seeing all these teams looking for bigger, more durable nickel corners who can still cover they hit a grand slam in this guy because he can has that athletic ability and movement where he can cover legit slots, but
but he can go in there and play with the big boys and get guys down and get off of blocks. They're hard to find. That's why you're getting these bigger guys playing this nickel spot, and he is ideal for it. All right, let's Spider go Man. on. Yeah, Spider-Man. Spider-Man. Uh, all right, Terrell Smith, the the rookie who um, uh, ended up probably having a bigger impact than we probably thought this year. Big, big. You can tell this is your cover to, you know, late round pick, big, long guy, got some straight line speed. They changed philosophically a lot they started playing a lot more man it's when he had to start playing a little bit more when you really watch the tape you know you like that he's a good football player you like that he's around the ball he's going to struggle in man coverage like if you want this guy to play man to man consistently throughout a game teams are going to go after him because he doesn't have he's leggy he doesn't have the foot quickness he's more of a build to speed guy He's your perfect old school cover two roll down corner. He's tough. He can tackle. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how they play going forward. Uh, love him as a fifth round pick. Um, I put him in the unsure kind of circumstance, still arrow up category. Need to see more. Um, love the physicality and size. My concern will be, if they're going to be a team that plays predominantly man coverage going forward, can he do that at corner? Or is he a guy maybe because of his size, smarts, and instincts, maybe is this a guy that eventually transitions and, and plays a little safety? Yeah, for all the good things that we said about Stevenson, I still found it so unique that the Bears still rotated in Terrell Smith for two to three series per game. Like This was part of their plan. They like him that much. I'm not completely where they are with him. I like, you know, he's a fifth round pick. You see some of the start, the starting traits. You see some of the value as a backup. You see why they want to develop him. But yeah, to me, he's squarely in circumstance. Like, where does he fit really when you have Jalen Johnson, Tyreek Stevenson, and Kyler Gordon as your top three right there? And I get it. You want depth. You need depth for all the reasons we just said about Jalen Johnson not finishing a season. Terrell Smith helps fill that. Um, but Maybe see a little bit more. I thought late in the year when he had to play a bit more um, because of injuries, certain things were exposed. But young player, you see the upside. Yeah, I mean, the way we're defining the circumstance category, this fourth category, young, yes. Unsure, yes. Feels somewhat positive, yes. I I, I do. Uh, and you want to work with them, yes. So it's like it's the definition of the circumstance category. Um, and it can, you know, I think there's, there's an arrow pointing up there and we're going to see more of Terrell Smith probably in uh in, in 2024. All right, let's oh, kind of go the question. Josh, yeah. do you think he could play safety? Yeah, that's what I was saying at the end there, you know, I think you know, zone awareness, range, speed, physical tackling. Um he has all those things when we talk about big corners that we think are a little too leggy to play man coverage for a living. Um, on the outside, he has all the prerequisites where you would say, hey, let's give him a try at safety, you know, and unless there's something I'm missing, um, just watching what I see on film, he can run, he can tackle and he can see the field. Um, to me, he would be a really good safety candidate. All right, let's uh, finish up the corners here. Just kind of go three for one really quickly uh, with Greg Stroman Jr., Jalen Jones and Josh Blackwell. Yeah, Stroman, um, probably a little bit old to put in that circumstance category. Um, you know, he's got a lot of time on task. You know, he 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 probably can fit in that average all the way down to below average. Um, I put him in the circumstance category because I'm still a little unsure and need to see more. And when he got a chance to play, especially against Washington, he played well. Um, you know, he's a nickel only with limited special teams value. So what he is, is he's your, he's an outstanding practice squad guy. Now that you're allowed to have vets on the practice squad, cause you know, he can come in and play nickel. Um, but he's just, he's not an ideal 53 man roster guy because he doesn't have great outside flex and he's not a great fourth down player. So he's, he's somewhere in that 
anywhere from three to five. And, and I just left them because um, I want to see more of them, uh, you know, this preseason, if he's back with the team and I put him in that circumstance category, but he's a guy that could fit in a bunch of different categories. How about Josh Blackwell? Where would you put him? Josh Blackwell. I put in three just because of he's a core teamer Yeah, as a corner. He's below average. Very similar to Dylan Cole. If we're just talking position value, he's not good enough. He's not a good enough cover guy. He's a really good teams player. So I put him in that average four core teams uh, 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 slot. And then Jalen Jones? Jalen Jones, same way. He's not good enough. Um, to me, To me, Jalen Jones is, you know, if you like him enough on special teams, he fits in that three. Um, if not, he's a below average, you know, target. I thought even in the preseason when he got out there, teams were going after him. Um, so you can put him in either either category. Um, you know, if we're trying to be consistent, um, he kind of fits in with Cole and Blackwell. So you could throw him in that average category because he's a good he's a good special teams player. I think that's how the Bears view him on the special team side too. I might put him in circumstance, but yeah, if we're it's like some of those guys almost need their own category. Just yeah, for, they're just they're just <laughs> core teams players. Yeah. All right. Um well in terms of need at corner, I mean, they just need to lock up Jalen Johnson. I mean, <laughs> it's that's pretty much that's pretty much it. Get Jalen done. It's no different than we were talking about at linebacker. You know, maybe you sign a cheap vet, you know, to come in and, and compete, um, you know, in the draft, late round, height, weight, speed guys with developmental upside that can play special teams. Um, you're trying to beat out Blackwell. You're trying to beat out Jalen Jones. The starting three, and I don't want to, I don't want to use hyperbole here, Um they might have the best starting three. They could very easily next year, we could be in the middle of the season and say they got the best starting three corners in the league. And I'm not afraid to say that. If, if Tyreek takes a jump, if Six takes another jump, and Jalen plays at the level he plays at this year, you look at these teams playing in the deep in the playoffs right now, it's not even close. Corners for San Francisco, corners for Detroit, um, not even close to what the Bears have. Um, so this is this is the strength of their team. Uh, it, it allowed them to change the identity of the defense, um, and they uh, they have done a hell of a job of of hitting on these two second round picks, and then obviously um, working with Jalen and, and and getting him to, to to play his best football. All right, let's move on to safety then, um, and I'm really. Curious to I, – I can't wait to hear your opinion on both of these guys. Let's start with Jaquan Brisker. Brisker, I put in the two. You look at the production, very similar from year one to year two. He has limitations. Um, you know, he's not a great back-end safety. His man coverage stuff is not ideal. There's going to be people in the building that argue he's just average and we'll put him in that average category. I think similar to the reason I put um, TJ Edwards and similar to the reason I put Billings in two is he's really good at his, what he does. He's really good as a down safety. He's an enforcer. He's tough as shit. Um, he brings that element to your defense. I don't think he took a jump from year one to year two, but I don't think he was ever healthy this year. I felt every single game he's laying on the ground after a hit. Um, and, and when you're playing like that, you, it's hard to play with extreme confidence. Next year is going to be a real big year for him. I want to see what he really is because I think this year just kind of plateaued because he was never really healthy. Um, good player, limited ceiling because he's never going to be a ball hawk guy on the back end, and he's not a great man-to-man -man coverage guy. Um, so I put him in that two would, wouldn't fight putting him in that average category either. I'm with you. I think he belongs in two because I think there's some intangibles with you, uh, with you, with him. And I think 
to your point, like that, that was my first note is there's always something like he was down a lot this season for, for various injuries. I know he had concussions. You have to take that seriously. Um, but for someone who wants to play as violent as he does, like, well, this could be a problem moving forward. I, I think he's bears defense is better with him. There's a lot of reasons to like what he can bring, but I like, do we not put an arrow? I don't want to say arrow down, but I don't think he has a, quite the arrow up that Kyler Gordon has after what happened this past season. I, I just, same category, no arrow for Brisker, if that makes sense. I agree. Yeah, I agree too. I, it, it's really that durability that concerns me the most, but, um, you know, maybe he can tweak some things. It, sometimes that's hard for a player like that, though, because they only know one speed. They only know, you know, what one way to throw their body around. Um, but he is a good, solid starter in my opinion. So he belongs in, in the, in the two category uh, for me. How about Eddie Jackson? What are your uh, better draft picks? A guy who's been uh, a lo- around forever now. Well, you know, he's, you know, he'd be, you know, if we were doing this live in the room, he, his magnet would be colored green because he's a um, one of two cap casualties on this team, you know, him and Cody Whitehair. Um, he's got a big number next year um, that I think, they're not going to be willing to pay. Um, you know, he's got a $14 million base salary in, in, uh, in 24 with an $18 million cap hit. He's having a hard time staying healthy. He's still a good player. And here's the, here's, here's the huge thing right now that, that is going to impact this decision. Is he the quarterback of that secondary? And does Brisker have any of those intangibles and traits? Because it's going to be really hard to replace. Um, huge difference in play when Eddie Jackson was not on the field this year. Like the drop off to him to the next guy was significant. He's tackled better these last two years under this new regime. He can still find the ball. He still gets his hands on balls. He, he can play the deep ball as good as any safety in the league. Perfect world. They can get him to restructure on a team-friendly deal and come back and continue to play opposite of Brisker because you don't want to create that need. Just putting him where he is right now, I still think he's a good player. You know, I, I still think when he's on the field and he's starting, if we're going to put Brisker on the, the good category, I think he's in the good category as well. Um, the arrow obviously is pointing down as he gets older and slower and doesn't move as well. Um, this guy's got rare football IQ vision from being around him. He's he's the quarterback of that secondary, and when you lose that, it can have a tremendous impact So, like, I don't know what that dynamic is right now between the rest of the guys. Um, This is going to be a real difficult decision for them because money-wise, they're not going to pay it. Um, And will he come back on a team-friendly deal? Um, My guess is being a Bear doesn't mean that much to him from being being around him for a while. And he's going to go where he wants to go and – think he's going to have a chance to win and get paid a decent amount of money. And, um, you know, my guess is he's going to be in another uniform next year. For a lot of things that, that you just said, like I, I went into this thinking they have to find a way to keep him at least for, for one more year. Um, I don't think he's going to take a pay cut or I don't know if restructuring means adding another year or he's now here for 2024 and 2025. Do you want to do that given his age and durability concerns? I don't know, but there's certain value beyond like the ball production for everything. Again, like you just said, Josh, that I think this defense is trending in such a great direction that removing Eddie Jackson, like, and it's like, can it still continue on that upward trajectory without him? Like, I want to say yes, but at the same time, like, they might miss him a bit, you know, for more reasons than you think. Um, interesting evaluation, um, just like just in terms of what they do next. But for this, for for this thing we're doing right now, this process, um, yeah, squarely 
in the two good category. He's a starter for me. My, my follow-up, though, is um, – actually, I have two things for you, Josh. One is he gets accused of not being the most reliable tackler or or making business decisions maybe sometimes, um, which at his age I, I think you can somewhat understand. Do you see that on tape? And then my, fo- my second question is if he hits the open market, though, what do you th- – what do you think he's getting out there? Because he does, he is still coming off that injury from so 2022. He, so we paid him and and he went, I mean, he disappeared as a tackler. It was shameful. Um, very frustrating um, that our coaches weren't able to make that um, connection with him. Um, was never a great tackler even before we paid him and straight out stopped tackling after we paid him. Uh, I remember last year thinking one of the things I really liked about Eberflus and this new staff was they got him to tackle. They got him to commit more. Um, is he a dog by no means? No, he, but you know, is he, is he, is he willing? Um, you know, a lot of times you can, you can shame guys into tackling, you know, when you're in that film room and 29's knocking people's heads off and 33 now's hitting people, six is knifing through the line of scrimmage and taking fullbacks and running backs out. Um, that helps. It rubs off. And and I thought four of the last two years has been a little bit better in that area. It's not perfect. His value is always going to be being the quarterback of the defense and being able to get his hands on balls. That will always be his value. If he hits the open market, <clears throat> I don't know cash wise how crazy that'll be. Demand from quantity of teams will be high because there's very few safeties that can get their hands on balls consistently that can track the deep ball and that can be the quarterback of the defense. He will have a lot of demand on the open market. I don't know how crazy that number will get, but trust me, there'll be plenty of teams that covet what he can do. 2009, one thing we were missing, a safety that could touch the ball. We had a pretty good defense. We were in New Orleans. Obviously, we were rolling on offense. We signed Darren Sharper, probably at a very similar point in his career, guy that was on the decline from a physical standpoint, from a movement standpoint, but was a quarterback of the defense and could touch the ball. Nine interceptions and a Super Bowl championship. Like I can see Eddie going to a team that is just missing kind of that ball hawking safety that has a defense that's already built um, and trying to win a championship um, if he decides to leave here. Uh, there will be demand for sure because – Safeties that can attack and and touch the ball and turn it over are hard to find. Well, and if that's the case, then I do I I agree. I think he'll be playing elsewhere next year because I oh, yeah. I I just can't imagine that they're gonna take that cap hit um, at this point. Uh, all right. Well, and just to wrap things up, let's see. We had Elijah Hicks in the circumstance category, and then Quindell Johnson in the in the below average category and i guess if we're going to talk safety needs then if you're if you're gonna move on from eddie jackson that becomes one of your biggest needs on on the team honestly yeah this is a need regardless because eddie's shelf life is going to be limited you know whether it's 2024 2025 you're already thinking we got a big physical safety that got hurt a lot this past year that's only in his second year, that's not great in man coverage, and it's not great in on the back end of the defense. And we got an old safety that we might have to cut, like multiple safeties. Don't be surprised if they, they spend some money on one, whether that's Eddie Jackson or another vet, and that they draft you know one or two safeties in the draft because this is a major area of need. I don't see the upside of Hicks at all. The rookie free agent that they claimed, Quindell Johnson, uh, I believe he's from Memphis. Very interesting player in that Baskerville kind of mold where he's small and he's not very fast, but he's a really good football player. 
So he's either a starter for you or he's on a practice squad because he doesn't have good special teams value. Um, so that'll be his issue going forward. He's a developmental guy to pay attention to, but by no means is he a guy that is going to um, uh, change the, the vision of how they're going to attack this. They need to bring in at least two more safeties. So just to recap, then, your, your needs you're looking at pass rusher, three technique, and then safety. I put pass rusher first just because where they ranked in sacks in this league. And I think you have something to work with in Jervon Dexter, but yeah. Um, some work to do even defensively for all the needs offensively. That's a different yeah. story. The big picture questions are still all over there, but I mean, pass rusher still a priority for me. They find consistent inside pass rush and get one quality edge rusher with some speed. You know, you're, in my, you're talking adding two players and the development of Javon Dexter with their ability to challenge people in man coverage with these three corners, they can have a defense that wins games for them consistently next year, which will be huge if they have a rookie quarterback. It will take so much pressure off of the offense and the quarterback. Um, I think if they do have a rookie quarterback next year with the offensive line, if they can add a little bit of skill on the outside, the way they run the ball, um, they can have a they can have a team to me that could resemble our 2018 team, where the defense is carrying it, and the offense it gives you just enough to win games, and then hopefully, in their case, it's it's an offense that has huge upward momentum going forward with that young quarterback. Obviously, we hit a wall. And then, then the thing came cr crumbling down. So you're, you're, you're looking at two or three players away from being really, really good on defense next year. Well, it'll get fans excited. It certainly seems that way on defense, though. And, um, and then the question becomes, yes, what is going on with the quarterback? But it was nice to have these two episodes this week where we didn't focus on that too much. Um, and... Josh isn't going anywhere. He's going to be still be uh, hanging out with us leading up to the draft. We're going to have plenty of time to talk about those quarterback decisions and the quarterbacks that are out there because he's been watching them very, very closely now, um, you know, going back to the fall. So um, we, we got plenty of that coming up as well. Josh, thanks so much for these two episodes this week and offering your insight. I know our, our listeners really appreciate it, enjoyed it uh, as we broke down this entire roster. Awesome. I loved it and uh, look forward to coming back. Just for uh, so everyone knows, next week we are actually going to be off all week on Hogan Johns because I am going to be uh, in Vegas with CHGO uh, for the Super Bowl doing live shows every single day, and the workload is uh, pretty intense. So uh, please check out CHGO and all the content we're going to have there on the CHGO YouTube page. Uh, we're live, sh live shows at noon central like we always do there Monday through Friday and a ton of bonus content as well as we talk to guest after guest after guest. Still can't convince Johns to go out there for the Super Bowl. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I I've covered my fair share <laughs> for it off the bat in my NFL coverage career. Um, I like to cover the Bears out there one year. Yeah, right? maybe. Maybe. Maybe, maybe that's on the way. Um, so stay tuned for all that. And, and of course, if anything, if there is any kind of big breaking news, we, you know, we'll, we'll, gotcha. we'll, we'll jump in with an emergency episode. We'll get Kevin Fishbane involved. Uh, so if there is anything that happens, um, stay tuned. Cause we will, we will jump in here, but otherwise, uh, please pay attention to CHGO all week long. John's enjoy the week. Josh, thank you very much. And, uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right. See ya. See you guys.